Alrighty, so I have some pretty interesting developments. Um, and I think I'll just probably go in chronological order here. So, uh, since my last video, I have seen Dr. Yoon, who is an orthodontist uh, and also does research in the field. And uh, she was amazing. She uh, answered so many of my questions and, and brought things to my attention that I didn't even know were important. Uh, one of the things was uh, she said that even after I finished my orthognatic, orthognatic surgery, there is still a chance that I'll still have symptoms. And she talks about the non-anatomical causes of sleep apnea. And uh, she shared with me some papers that I can share with you. So uh, one of these papers talks about phenotypic approaches to obstructive sleep apnea, new pathways for targeted therapy. And uh, some of the non-anatomical causes of sleep disordered breathing that it talks about is low respiratory arousal threshold. So even if you have just a little bit of an uh, resp increase of respiratory effort uh, that is not unhealthy, if you have a low arousal threshold, you might wake up anyway. Another one's called unstable ventilatory control or high loop gain. Basically what that means is that, so there's this loop that, that can happen where basically if you have some sort of increase in respiratory effort, which sometimes is natural, you might have an arousal, which will lead to hyperventilation. Your sympathetic nervous system activates, you start hyperventilating, and you exhaust too much CO2, but you will eventually return to sleep anyway. So that's an overcompensation. Then you might do some sort of undercompensation where you hypoventilate, and this can cause your upper airway to relax too much, causing uh, upper airway narrowing or collapse, which then leads to more respiratory effort and the cycle can c repeat. So another non-anatomical cause is <clears throat> ineffective upper airway dilator muscles. So your muscles are just ineffective for one or another reasons. Maybe they're weak or you, know, you haven't been using them properly. And so even when I finish these surgeries, it's possible that I'll need further treatment uh, but luckily there are some answers for a few of these. So low respiratory arousal threshold. Um, I, I also brought these things up to Dr. Zaghi and he told me that low respiratory arousal threshold can be helped by meditation. Uh, Dr. Yoon said that low respiratory arousal threshold can be helped by taking a very small dose of some like hypnotic medication. I think trazodone is an example of one of those where it just kind of sedates you uh, ever so slightly so that your respiratory arousal threshold um, actually increases a bit. For ineffective upper airway dilator muscles, uh, Dr. Zaghi mentioned myofunctional therapy as a treatment, which if you haven't already heard of, um, is basically a bunch of exercises to tone some of the muscles in your face, and, and uh, there, there might be more to it. I'm, I'm probably oversimplifying it. And Dr. Zoggi also mentioned that there can just be this kind of phenomenon where if you've had sleep disordered breathing for so many years, your brain just kind of, I don't think it's quite understood, but your brain just kind of is that way now, and you might just have some sort of, I don't know, anxious brain or something, and you, you might still just have these kind of, I don't know, ghost arousals, I'll call them. Another question I asked to Dr. Yoon uh, was about the Lefort 1 or Lefort 1 style cuts. Uh, previously, I had told you about this trade off that, um, you know, some surgeons like Dr. Vaughn believed that it was uh, important or necessary for, uh, especially in adult men for predictable and stable expansion. Uh, whereas Dr. Koppelson was more feeling that if you only do a mid palatal cut, you can optimize the expansion of the width of the nasal aperture by tilting the mid face outward. I brought this up to Dr. Yoon and she said that she is a supporter of the Lefort one cut. Uh, it's part of her dome procedures, a, a term she coined, distraction, osteogenesis, maxillary expansion. And basically, she said that yes, uh, it does make it much more predictable and stable. Expansion fails very, uh, often without it in adult men. 
She said that her and Stanley Liu had spent years trying all different types of cuts until they settled on this one. And most interestingly, she also said that it's not necessary to expand the width of the entire nasal aperture, but rather the bottlenecks of airflow. And she said that the Lafort one cuts expanding the floor of the nasal aperture, that the lower portion of the nasal aperture is the important part to expand anyway. And uh, she essentially told me, don't worry about that. So Dr. Yoon also brought uh, another really important thing up. Um, which actually doesn't apply to me, and I'll, I'll tell you why, but I thought it would. Um, she gave me some advice on how to get my insurance company to pay for my orthognatic surgery, which I wanted to share with everybody. So my original diagnosis of sleep apnea had an AHI of 7.3, and this is considered mild sleep apnea. And for that reason, it's common for insurance companies to not deem the surgeries as medically necessary and that means they might refuse to pay for it. And she recommended that I get a PES study. So these studies, I don't exactly understand how they work. They put some tube down your airway and it measures the pressure throughout your esophagus. And she told me that it's a much better diagnostic tool for AHI than my original watch pad study. She said she wouldn't be surprised if my AHI of 7.1 actually was revealed to be somewhere like 25, which is considered moderate sleep apnea, which means that my insurance company would be much more likely to pay for my surgery. In my case, I got lucky. Uh, LA Comms submitted a authorization something, and I got a letter saying that my insurance company did deem my surgery as medically necessary, which is very relieving. But uh, even more news, uh, I found out that Dr. Yoon's preferred surgeon, who she did a lot of research with and, and uh, established that dome procedure with, is Dr. Stanley Liu at Stanford. He is an oral maxillofacial surgeon, and he is in my network, which means that the maxillary expansion uh, won't be covered. The orthodontics, I don't think, will be covered. but that really expensive 25, 30, whatever thousand dollar surgery, the double jaw surgery with maybe the chin surgery as well, might be totally or nearly totally covered, which is just a huge, huge weight off my shoulders. Okay, so another interesting thing is that my titration study results came back. I last time told you guys that my sleep tech told me that I was waking up every two minutes. Now, my sleep doctor that ordered the titration study, Dr. Kashani said that the sleep tech was wrong. He shouldn't have said that. Uh, he said he looked at the data and it looks normal. And I looked at it, I guess it looks normal too, I don't really know. Um, I was having some arousals, but within the normal range. Um, and uh, I, you know, it was, I didn't know what to make of it at first. I um, kind of, it kind of made me worried that, oh my gosh, am I, doing these surgeries for a totally wrong reason? Am I not having unresolved sleep disordered breathing? What's going on? Um, so I talked to him. He told me, no, you're not having unresolved sleep disordered breathing. Just then and there, you're having something else. Uh, he encouraged me to kind of uh, reevaluate perhaps depression or anxiety or mood issues as a cause of uh, daytime fatigue. And uh, he did say that you know, he says that, you know, some people, they really don't like CPAP. He said if you would like to try an oral appliance, the mandibular advancement device, that he would put an order in for me. And uh, I told him I'd think about it. And one thing he did say is that he said, you know what, if you'd like to get a second opinion, I have some people that I'd recommend. And he recommended I talk to Dr. Mendelssohn, uh, who is an ENT uh, who also does focus a little in sleep apnea at UCLA. And he also referred me to Dr. Eric Kazirian, who is a, also an ENT, but at USC. And uh, for those who don't know, Dr. Kazirian and Dr. Zaghi professionally disagree very heavily. It's, it's a bit of a uh, interesting gossip. So if you wanna kinda check out some of their conversation uh, I'll leave some links into the description of D Dr. Kazarian's 
uh, articles and, and videos on the topic, uh, which personally I don't have any opinions of. I would not even begin to give my opinion on who, who's right and who's wrong, but I just thought it'd be interesting to share nonetheless. Anyway, I, talking to Dr. Mendelssohn, he told me that he wasn't convinced that the titration study is proof of res fully resolved sleep disordered breathing. He said that in those two and a half hours that I was asleep, I was having fully resolved sleep disordered breathing, but it was only two and a half hours. There's a lot of variation. And so he put in an order for me to uh, drug induced sleep endoscopy, which is basically uh, they drug you so you can kind of artificially fall asleep and they put some cameras down your airway and they, they visually try to look for where these restrictions and obstructions are happening to kind of verify how best to open up the airway. He specifically talked about all these different options of surgery and every one of them was a soft tissue procedure uh, as opposed to orthognatic surgery or these type of kind of osteotomy bone uh, structural procedures and um, I wasn't a fan of any of those soft tissue procedures. I, I truly do feel that the route that I've kind of on MSE with the MMA I do think is the best route for me right now. I've already had a soft tissue procedure. It didn't do anything. I know that's not proof of uh, soft tissue procedures not being right for me but I have gotten opinions of other ENTs and they said that uh, there's no clear soft tissue that is enlarged or uh, anything like that in my airway. So I talked to Dr. Zaghi, I said, what is this uh, endoscopy really going to do for me? And he said, you know, it, it might be cool, it might be interesting if I can get it covered, and which I think I should be able to. Uh, maybe it would uh, give me a little bit of uh, fun information, but he said it wouldn't change my treatment plan, which I, which I had you know, that's what I was thinking anyway. So Dr. Kazarian uh, had an interesting opinion. He said that my titration study was not proof of unresolved sleep disordered breathing, uh, not proof of resolved sleep disordered breathing. And he also said that it was, he said that even the titration study itself in those two and a half hours wasn't really proof of, of resolved sleep disorder breathing. He said that this sleep disordered breathing is not very well understood and it, you just cannot make uh, certain claims about anything, really. And uh, I thought that seemed very wise. He said that I'm a particularly difficult case to understand really what's going on beforehand. I think there's just going to be some chances I'm going to have to take, which I'm more than happy to take. And both Dr. Kazarian and Dr. Mendelssohn said, you know, it's, it's still very clear that I'm having unresolved sleep disordered breathing. The question is just how much of my symptoms are due to unresolved sleep disordered breathing. Another update for the Breathe Institute course. I have a couple recordings I have to go back and watch because I couldn't make some of the live, I couldn't make some of the parts of the live course. So I think once that's done. I'm going to talk a little about that. So that's everything for now. I think I have a pretty good understanding of what to do next. Um, and honestly, I think when I get off this uh, vlog, I'm going to call Dr. Yoon and, and set up an appointment to get my MSE installed. So exciting things to come. I hope some of this information has been useful. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, please drop any questions you have and thanks for watching.